Square at Red Top Mountain State Park at the resort area and conference center. And uh, I have some distinguished gentlemen with us today who have just finished up a series of meetings uh, concerning some real history that's planned for the future uh, to commemorate some historical things that have happened. And we're going to talk about all of that. But first of all, let me introduce to you J.B. Tate, who has been with Channel 4 before in the past discussing some things of a historical nature concerning Civil our War, area. Cherokee and Innsness area. Our, our real authority here. J.B., you are president of the Etowah Historical Society. Etowah Valley Historical Etowah Society. Etowah Valley right. Historical Society. And also, you are teach at Kennesaw? I've taught there for 25 years. And your area of expertise? American history. American history. And, ne and next to a J.B. is David Gaines with the National Park Service. And Jerry, I want to make sure I pronounce your name properly. Jerry Krakow? Krakow. Krakow. Yes. And you are a historian with the National Park Service in Denver? That's right. And you have had several people gathered up here for the past couple of days to talk about the the coming together of the Trail of Tears. Um, uh, J.B., I'll start with you. Okay. In uh, 1987, Congress appropriated and funded a National Trail of Tears Historic Trail. Yes. And of course, um, it's estimated that three-fourths of Cherokees lived in Georgia at the time of the removal. So the trail will encompass nine states, beginning in Georgia, ending in Oklahoma. Mm -hmm. And what this trail, it will be a historic trail. And it will encompass those nine states. So that's basically the, the planning and the preparation of uh, putting this trail together is what this conference is essentially all about. And it's, it's an ongoing project. We met in Oklahoma in September. Now we're meeting in Georgia. Uh, the next meeting will be in uh, Cape Girardeau, Missouri, at different sites along the trail. So it's an ongoing process. This will not put the trail together, this particular meeting. It's, uh, this will go on for a few more years okay. before it's uh, And as completed. president of the Etowah Valley Historical Society, you've sort of put this conference together, is that right? No. Uh, we meet uh, at a different state where the, uh, which would encompass right. the trail. So it was agreed to meet. That the first was at the end of the trail, and the beginning would be Georgia. Mm -hmm. So last uh, September we met in Oklahoma. We start next in Georgia and then at different sites with the ongoing meetings over the next few years. Okay. Uh, David Gaines, as National Park Service uh, representative, tell me about what the plans are at this point. Okay. Well, right now we are uh, prepared to approve the comprehensive management and use plan for the trail, which has been in development for about three years. Mm -hmm. And the advisory council uh, today endorsed the, the uh, revised plan, which was subject to public input last fall. And so we're looking to complete that plan this, this summer, and we'll be ready to implement in the fall. And what it will entail is basically, as J.B. alluded to, a National Historic Trail whose purpose is to help commemorate uh, the, the tragic removal of, of the Cherokees, as well as the other uh, eastern tribes. Uh, through resource management and protection of sites along the trail, uh, the provision of public use opportunities along it so that the public may retrace it through hiking and walking uh, opportunities, uh, the provision of interpretive programs to better commemorate and tell the story so that the public is, is uh, well versed in, in this chapter in American history. It's a very sad chapter. It's, very, it's a sad chapter and I think it's time that we, we came to grips with that. As historian, Jerry, uh, what was your input at the, at the conference this past couple of days? Well, I'm in charge of the plan in terms of getting the data collected and the plan put together in its draft forms. I was also the historian on the project in charge of mapping and inventorying the historic sites along the trail. So my role the last couple of days has been as sort of a resource person for the advisory council and presenting uh, the changes that we heard from the public in the review period last fall to incorporate those and to hear what the advisory council had as concerns for any changes that they might recommend in the draft. Well, how, how do things go, J.B., or do you feel like you're I, I think the everybody, right at this point? When we concluded uh, the meeting, I think everybody felt like it had been a very productive session. And in particular, uh, I think the advisory council, this is the second one that I've attended. So one, once you've um, been through the hoops once the second time, it feels more productive. Mm -hmm. more, and a lot of the people who were with me this time were in Oklahoma several months ago. So I, I think um, that we begin to see the whole concept uh, get implemented now as 
as each session took place over the last uh, two days. There must be a myriad of details, uh, David, that have to be worked out. If you're talking about um, acquiring land and, and you're probably dealing with private property as well as public facilities, is, is that going to be a problem, a slow, ongoing process? Well, the process will be, be, be ongoing. I don't think it'll necessarily have to be slow, depending on the, on the public receptivity. But I think we've had overwhelming public support from, from government level down to the, the individual landowner. There's very little land acquisition involved. What we propose to do, basically, is to develop cooperative agreements with private landowners, not necessarily along the whole length of the trail from Georgia to Oklahoma, but in select sections that lend themselves to public use, uh, we propose to develop some type of, of trail network uh, to allow for, for that public access and use. But again, based on cooperative agreements with landowners, and I think we can satisfy any concerns they have about liability and, and other concerns. We're doing this now on the Santa Fe National Historic Trail, which, which we also manage, um, and this is the way of the future. Very good. Is it, once again, as, as a historian, and I could relate this to ask this question of either you, JB, or Jerry, um, s some of the background about what this is all about. I mean, it is a very sad chapter in our history. Um, uh, some some storyline about where this, how this happened, and what happened. You know, briefly, Jerry, could you tell us a little bit? About that? I guess uh, to summarize, at the risk of brevity, <laughs> uh, is difficult, but it's uh, a story of. Uh, Georgia coveting the lands that the Native American populations held, in this particular instance, the Cherokees, and in, in coveting that land, sought ways of removing them. And so from, as JB put it uh, a couple of days ago, the trail really runs from the individual cabin door of the Cherokee family uh, all the way to Indian Territory, now the state of Oklahoma with collection points at removal forts in Georgia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Alabama, to internment camps uh, near the Hiawassee, near Cleveland, Tennessee, and most of the groups traveled by land, although three detachments traveled by water. Uh, in the period of 1838 and 39 is what the legislation that commemorates this trail specifically indicates. And that national legislation is what we have to focus on. So even though there were Cherokees that left before 1838, uh, our focus on this National Historic Trail is 1838 and 1839. JB, what is, as president of the Etowah Valley Historical Society, I mean, what um, things will you be doing in an ongoing nature, and what can our community do here? Well, that, that's exactly what we discussed earlier this morning. Um, <coughs> One of the priorities that we have in the very near future is, is to um, hope to foment an advocacy group like Friends of the Trail of Tears, that type of, con that wouldn't be called it necessarily, but that type of concept, and to identify people on the county level here, the state level, uh, to, to become uh, actively involved in promoting this trail as it begins to reach public awareness, you know, through programs such as this. Yeah. And, and whatnot. There'll be more publicity as time goes on. So that this is definitely something that every local historical society could take an interest in mm -hmm. as a trail, uh, not only whether the trail went through their particular county or not, if they have Indians, which all of Northwest Georgia did, then as we said, the, the trail started at, the, at their cabin door. Right. And for how many miles? 2,200 miles. 2, miles. That's both the water and the land route that are commemorated. And how many people died? Well, that's a subject of some debate among academicians. The traditional figure is 4,000, but the latest scholarship uh, reported in a journal article and a, and a book by Russell Thornton on the faculty of the University of California at Berkeley states that it was 8,000 people, and the basis of that is the disruption in birth rates prior to the forced march during the march or the removal and then the disruption of birth rates after they got to Oklahoma. So there's been some revision of that. It's, it's a subject of, of discussion and some debate, I think, in academic circles at this point. There were 16,000 originally removed. It's a sad story, the information that you gave passed on to me, JB. That's right. It will bring tears to your eyes, and people should be made more aware. But you are finding that the public is receptive, that we are becoming more conscious of our past sins right. and trying to 
in some way do something about it. Yeah, there's, I think there's a tremendous reservoir of goodwill out there. I think people are looking to uh, recognize what, what's happened in the past and start the healing process. Very good. Uh, so we feel good for the future, gentlemen? Things are moving along as, yes. as expected? Yes. Anything you would like to add as far as a, um, what can be done, what we can do with citizens to help promote this um, idea? It's a great idea, great program. I think, uh, as JB alluded to, I think there, there is a need for public participation in this process. It's, it's got to be a grassroots managed trail. And while the National Park Service is present to set the course with a plan and to provide technical assistance and, and in many cases, uh, some financial assistance, it's really grassroots participation that's going to make the trail come alive on, on a day-to-day -day basis. So that's, that's really the, the, the biggest need right now is to become involved. I would just echo that. I think it's only as strong as the individuals that are local citizens and residents across the nine states. It's a cooperative venture uh, between citizenry and governments, and that's, I think, the focus of what it should be and will continue to be. All right, and JB? They're not really breaking any uh, new ground with this particular trail because the Santa Fe Trail is, is ahead of this one. Mm -hmm. And they've really had uh, some real success stories, as I understand it, with adv advocacy, grassroots support on the Santa Fe Trail. So if we can have the same type of reception here in the East as they've had there, then it, it should be a very successful venture. Very good. So far, so good. Well, let's talk to a couple of more gentlemen and uh, ladies, perhaps, to find a little bit more about this. Uh, just a very committed effort, and I commend you both, all of you. Thank you. 